One thing that I wanted to ask you about with as far as uh, Odo Sensei goes. Knew, her, knew of him and trained with him over a course of 18 years. So uh, where you're, you're doing a shoot okay and you grab and you pull. And you now, uh, you know, it comes down to physics, but are more associated to the influence of Chinese art. It's typical in Okinawa Kempo is a heel kick. So it'd be a heel kick to the chin, pow, up this way. You're kicking the shoulder socket. He'd, he'd be up front and very, you know, straight with me and say, no, do it this way. And so I did. Yeah. <laughs> I, can't, I can't remember the reason or the cause. Yeah. Well, at some point, though, you did have to leave the island. Well, you didn't have to. You chose to. Yes, that was uh, 1988. Yeah, 1988, I left. Uh, I left the island. Um, let's see, I was 23. I had already started taking some classes, like, you know, uh, the off-campus University of Maryland that the military has, and and it was an opportune time for me. As a friend of mine uh, was able to fund a startup or a company in it and it ended up being here in the bay area or as they call it locally here in the bay area that's uh silicon valley area basically um and so that's what you know drew me to this area you know once i got here it was really about the job and about um you know pursuing school yeah, I was training off and on through either college clubs or uh, college uh, classes. I think I've been in two college classes. One was geared more from TKD, Taekwondo. Uh, I forgot what the other one was. But it was a, a karate. I think it was a, a Shotokan of sorts. Uh, and then the other was a club where there were uh, a mix of students from all over the world. Uh, who had experience, even including uh, Japan, where we would take turns on a daily basis to share their art. Mm. And we would just have them lead and we would just go through the drills as they would instruct. You know? uh, but I found that to be more pre uh, beneficial to continue my training. Um, but besides that, it was more or less on my own. Uh, but you were... Um, it was about 10 years just training on my own. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, going, you know, either I was either with a club or in a class, you know, through college, which is, you know, we don't really count those, um, trying different dojos, uh, being kicked out of dojos. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a lot. It was either Shotokan or Taekwondo, you know, back here, I was new to the politics. I really was. I call me naive, but I didn't see it. I didn't understand it. Um, yeah, I trained, you know, 18 years in Okinawa. And I had a black belt. I thought, so what? You know, but I go into a Taekwondo class, and uh, the, I know nothing about Taekwondo. But respectfully to the sensei and for the art, I put on a white belt, uh, and I go in. Of course, my gi didn't have my patch on or anything. It's plain white gi. And I go in and request to join the class, and I join the class. After a couple classes, typically, I'd get booted out because they felt as though I was um, either planning to take over the dojo or they suspected me of just stealing their drills or techniques from my own school. Uh, this stupid stuff, you know, and or they would blame me for not telling them that I was probably a black belt in another style. And my answer was usually, my answer was usually, you didn't ask. Yeah. <laughs> you, know? Yeah. Uh, you know, of course, you know, if, if they said, oh, uh, have you had, you know, experience in martial arts? Yes. <laughs> That's... They don't ask, if they don't ask me an open-ended question or they're wanting more specifics, then yeah, what yeah. am I going to do? Yeah. Uh, because to me, it's irrelevant to them uh, because it's a different art. Mm -hmm. right? It's a different style. And so respectfully, I, I'm like, my response to them was, I'm here being respectful to you. I wear a white belt. Uh, 
you know, besides a punch and kick, I don't know your katas. I don't know how your balances. I don't know how you move. You know, it seems different to me. Mm-hmm. But usually the thing that will get them is like if the class lines up to kick a bag or something. And, uh, you know, being new to newest to the class, I line up at the very end where the mm-hmm. seniors at the very front. Mm-hmm. And let's say we're doing a slide up side kick or something. So I'll kick the bag. And so the one that's in, I started first, the most seated ends up behind me, mm-hmm. right? As we're lining up, kick the bag. So then it's my turn, I kick the bag. In this particular case, it was a class uh, at the college. <clears throat> and I didn't realize it was probably more of a punching bag than a kicking bag. So it was a lightweight bag. But the way it was moving, I, I thought it was supposed to be a heavy bag. So I line up and I kick it and I blast the bag and the bag hits the ceiling tiles and it <laughs> comes down. And I was very apologetic, I'm, you know, bowing to them. I'm so sorry. I'm really sorry. I didn't mean, and I was sincere and I really felt awful. So then, then I line up at the end again. Now, what are people going to, they're going to compare me against the senior, yep. right? So he kicks the bag, and he's going all out at it. And uh, you know, <laughs> you know, so that's how things usually yep. end it. Uh, you know, then the sensei or he call me, uh, you know, over to the corner and say, "You must have had other experience before." I, yes, I told you, I, 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 I did. Uh, and uh, but no, you must have had several years. I, I said, I do. I. I trained in Okinawa Kempo for 18 years. Why are you here? <laughs> that was usually the case. I was because I wanted to learn something different. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I, I had nowhere to go. Yeah. You know, I, this kept getting kicked out. Yeah. I, 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 I mean, the last thing I wanted was to somebody or someone to assume I wanted to be accepted as a black belt or something. I wouldn't yeah. do that to anyone. Yeah. You know, it's just, but people don't understand that. I mean, that's, I think, more as part of the culture, right? Yeah. That common understanding amongst yeah. the people in Okinawa. It's the culture. Even Japan's, it's the culture. Yeah. So you got kicked out of a few schools in the, in the Bay Area. Were you, this was also in the Bay Area? Okay. Yes, um, yes. And that, but during that time, were you coming back to Okinawa to visit? Or did you leave and, and not uh, really come back for a lar- uh, several years? Yeah, I didn't come back for several years. Um, I forget when I regularly started to come back. Ten years ago? Okay. I mean, uh, I know firsthand, about, and you know firsthand, of course, how expensive it is. It's not something you do <laughs> yeah, yeah. typically all the time. Um, right, right. Even, even as a single person. Years, yeah. I think it's been for about ten years now that I've tried to. People okay, like, so yeah. at that time you weren't necess- you weren't coming back and even being able to see Odo Sensei then and, and train in the dojo here in Okinawa in Okinawa Kempo. Yeah, I did. Uh, I think at least three times since '88 to in that ten year period, I probably came back two or three times. Uh, and every time I'd go, I'd always bring my gi, of course, and uh, uh, my dad would figure out where Odo Sensei's classes were and you know, would go and, go and surprise train. him and say, hi, Sensei. <laughs> yep. 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 But at some point in your training, you had told me that you got involved with Wushu? Yes. Uh, in about 98, sometime thereabouts, uh, again, for this quest for finding the right sensei or teacher uh, and a dojo. That's what I was really missing. Um, I couldn't find anything that was Okinawan. Now, this was kind of before internet yeah, you know, really was yeah. really commonplace uh, for, or available to public or to, uh, for folks to be using cell phones not available. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, I happened to be introduced to this uh, wushu uh, coach, as they call him. His name is Richard Brandon, and uh, he's from the East Coast. But he was mostly known for tournaments and 
being a stunt actor uh, in the in the films uh, like Power Rangers and so forth. <laughs> so, but he was very good at what he taught. So wushu. Um, so I was in wushu for about ten years, uh, and of course that's quite challenging for the body. Certainly not something you want to consider, you know, in your thirties. Um, but I did. And uh, if I, that's one thing I definitely benefited from having gymnastics background. <laughs> okay. um, but what I loved about Ushu was that I could see the Chinese, um, you know, origins in Kempo. Now, Okinawa mm. Kempo has a lot of katas that uh, are shared, you know, amongst almost all of the short and use styles mm -hmm. like you know how many how many uh styles in okinawa don't have a naihanchi right you know, don't have pinons or don't have pastas of one variation or another right? yep. kusanku so, yeah yeah and and many of these like the pinons and pasta and wanshu you know those are very typical of um sort of a cross between a southern style and northern style uh, Chinese art forms uh, where you're showing strength and uh, rigidity and power, which would be more of a southern style. And a northern style is more about flexibility and dynamics, uh, much like a kusanku or your pasai or your pasai uh, uh, or kusanku and uh, pasai and pinankatas, right? It's showing more dynamics and more uh, open hand movements uh strikes and blocks and so forth um a lot of uh more complex body transitions you know body transitions uh, but in the way that odo sensei taught them uh even in okinawa kempo today uh, maybe by result of who the teachers are today but at least in the way that it was a little different for Odo Sensei is that there were more body dynamics, more twists and turns and movements uh, that Odo Sensei would show or teach uh, these katas. Uh, but with that said, you know, I saw the Chinese uh, influence in Okinawa Kempo, and when I saw Wushu, I thought, wow, you know, it was, if it was a low stance, it was even lower. If it was a high kick, it was even higher. If it was, you know, <laughs> it was just mm -hmm. sort of, uh, a very uh, extreme case mm -hmm. of, you know, because it was Chinese. Mm -hmm. But that's what really drew me, for one. But it wasn't by uh, Coach Brandon. In the way that he displayed it, his spirit was just so real. Um, you know, when he did a kata, um, when he would punch, he would punch, whereas it was very realistic, you know, in the old sense of traditional martial arts. Whereas Wushu, in a lot of cases, in the way that is displayed today, is more of, of a uh, presentation art. It's mm. just a display of technical movements, mm. uh, you know, more like a dance or a, or a gymnastic routine, mm. where, you know, people that are performing these, you know, they'll look and they'll punch and they'll move in such a way, but they don't have the focus. They don't have the spirit displayed within the kata. Uh, so the realism is lost. And so a lot of people loved it for the dynamic movements and so that these acrobatic movements, which is commonplace. Uh, but the way that Richard Brandon was displaying his to break it down, basically, his punches and kicks and his realism, I just, you know, was, uh, wow, you know, this is the closest to the martial arts that I'm used to and looking for. So that's when I signed up. Uh, so I was training in Wushu for about 10 years, maybe a little over 10 years. Wushu had kata or forms i mean similar to yes. an okinawa style you have yes but they were typically much longer um 
So a typical kata in the Okinawan styles can take from 30 seconds to maybe 45 seconds. Yeah. Right? Done in a you know, regular speed. Uh, for the wushu katas, it was almost a requirement to have it done well and done correctly. It would last about a minute and 20 seconds to 30 seconds. So it was a very long kata. Uh, so it was, it was quite interesting. And of course, with the, these katas that they had, or these forms that they would have, and the complexity, you know, I, I would be, I'd be lying to say that, you know, my previous background didn't help. Yeah. It, it did every bit. Yeah. It just extended that that much more to understand the body mechanics as well. Um, and that shown that showed through even more with weapons. As I uh, started off with what they call a cudgel, which is a seven foot staff, but it's tapered in one direction. So it's basically a trunk of a big weed. <laughs> so, uh, so it's fat at one end and it tapers all the way down to the top at the other end. That was one. And then I also did a uh, broadsword, double broadsword, straight sword, uh, and spear. But what the main difference was that it was fast. It was fast. You wouldn't be able to see the weapon or uh -huh. the blades. Just uh -huh. that's that's what was so fast. That, that was so different. The tempo was extremely fast by comparison. Did you do um, yakso kumite or types of kumite drills with? A, a partner and and also was there any sparring or kumite against other dojos or in tournaments or any type of uh, similar to what you did mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yes um there so wushu uh just to get that sort of clarified wushu just means war art just like saying martial art and then you try to define well, which martial art Right, which would definitely define whether you use more hands or feet or whether you throw or grab, right? That, that would define the art. But wushu, just because it's just martial art, is um, when defined as wushu or called wushu is really what is most universally representative of what they teach in China as what is representative of their art. Now, this emphasis was a, sort of a part of a stimulus to have China recognize their martial arts or, or this wushu as their representation of their version of martial arts and be represented in the Olympics. They never got to that point. So while I was still training in martial arts, uh, you know, a punch is a punch, a kick is a kick. Um, so I think for anyone that is, you know, away from the dojo or uh, f trying to find a way to continue their training, as long as you're moving in a similar way, mm -hmm. uh, I think it helps every bit. Um, and with wushu, while some of the stances can be different, I mean, there are more stances than I ever imagined there were. Uh, really? You know, yes, absolutely. There, there are so many different stances, some you can't even get into. <laughs> okay. That's how hard some of these stances are. Um, so, for me, in order to stay, you know, not current, but stay familiar or comfortable with Okinawa Kempo or the traditional karate. I would still practice, and of course, as anybody would, I, I'd mainly practice my favorite kata or my favorite weapons or you know, some of these things. But, uh, you know, for the longest time, I, I wasn't even touching my nunchucks or you know, something like that. And, and I look back and I'm kind of ashamed of that, but, you know, <laughs> uh, but bull, of course, was always my, not always, but has been at least one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was very familiar with that. And the cudgel or the bull uh, in wushu 
was also my favorite uh, for similar reasons. But the, the point I was going to get was that while I was training in Wushu, um, I also continued to practice my karate. So at the dojo I was training in, it wasn't just Wushu. It was a Taekwondo school. Okay. Uh, and my coach, Richard Brandon, was a uh, another head coach at the same school. And uh, this school was actually run by, uh, uh, it was owned and run by another Taekwondo sensei, also well known in the movies. His name is Larry Lamb. Okay. Uh, Larry Lamb was one of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. So th this was uh, not the same school that you got kicked out of for side kicking a bag up to no, the ceiling. No. Okay. No, these guys, you know, both of these gentlemen, Larry Lamb and Richard Brandon, wow, they are true martial artists. I don't care how you know much of a XMA type of view they get looked upon, you know, for being able to do these fast kicks and high kicks and acrobatic movements uh, because they're both stuntmen. They both are. Uh, if you look up Larry Lamb, you'll see how many movies he's been in. He's, he's like a, you know, stuntman rock star. Uh, but he's worked with the likes of Jackie Chan and Jet Li, you know, all of these guys. But, um, but that's kind of the place I was in. I thought, wow. You know, this is like so much going on. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, with that, uh, Richard Brandon, you know, the Wushu coach, he was starting to build up his class. And I think I started about six months or so after he started teaching Wushu. And um, I joined in. I was probably maybe the within the first maybe five to eight students, you know. I was just one of them and training. And as we started to evolve as students, all of these other students were in Taekwondo. I was the only one that wasn't in Taekwondo. Right? So they had their way of punching and kicking and doing certain things. But they were uh, students in Taekwondo under a different teacher because Richard Brandon wasn't teaching Taekwondo. Um, so the spirit and the, the style uh, was different. Right, um, and he was more of a hard style kung fu type of background. So that's why I just love seeing a spirit in his kata, mm -hmm. the way he displays techniques. You know, it's really awesome. Um, but when it came to time for us to, you know, try tournaments, he was all for it. He loved tournaments. He was like, you know, world grand champion for like uh, five or six years in the uh, NASCAR tournament series. And you've probably heard of NASCA. NASCA is National Association of Sport Karate. Ah, uh, okay. Something. Okay. And these tournaments would draw like 2,000 competitors. Mm -hmm. These were big events, huge events. They would last like three or four days. And so we started to go to these. Um, and these were, you know, world recognized. Um, and so we were competing in these tournaments and even at these tournaments i thought well why not i'm i'm there competing in wushu anyways in soft style i'm also going to compete in hard style and do karate so i did mm -hmm. and nobody did it and the judges would always look at me and say they you know one or two of them might have been in the same you know <laughs> ones that would judge the previous you know competition that I was in. I don't know which one was generally for a soft style or hard style, uh, but they said, weren't you just, uh, yes. And I would, I'd be in black silks with gold trim. Yeah. And one time, you know, because I competed in weapons as well as kata and, and both. And then, so then I'd come back with a white gi, you know, doing a very different style, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, hard to win in those, um, you know, environments, uh, because generally in soft style, style especially, or, or if it was specifically in wushu, I've also competed in wushu only competitions where I've won in, uh, but the judges and everybody knows 
exactly what you're supposed to be doing because they know the kata. Right, right, right. Uh -huh. Right, and there's certain restrictions as to what you can and can't do as far as tolerance because not everyone can do a split kick or land in a split, and, you know, whatever. Uh, but there were diff different rules, and so you had some tolerance or understanding. Whereas an open tournament, you can do whatever you want. You know, so there were no set yeah. defined rules for a kata or something. So that made it even harder. So typically, people that did wushu would win, um, but they would win based on maybe how cool their techniques were and whether it was realistically kata, you know, martial arts or not. Right. And so that would usually win over, you know, uh, the tournament. Um, but in my at my age, nobody was doing that. <laughs> nobody was competing. So, so I would you, get... You were in your 30s at this time? Yeah. Okay. So I would get bumped down into the 20-year-old group. So no way in heck that I'm going to beat these guys that are, you know, really dynamic, fully pumped, or, you know, had all the energy, you know. Uh, um, but I tried, yeah. you know. In that type of environment, I had a hard time winning. But in a wushu environment, same thing. And at my age, then they would, the judges would question me, "Are, are you, are you really thirty years old? <laughs> you know, and you're going to do what? Double broadsword? Uh, yes, I see food and all that sort of more. <laughs> but then, uh, it's okay, <laughs> you know, because they would have to bump me down to the next age group." there was nobody at my age group. Okay. So they would bump me down to the group that was like, like top notch, right? <laughs> yeah, and yeah. So sometimes I'd walk out of there with a medal or something, but they would always question me that. And then they they bring me back up front again. Again, you you are, you know, thirty five <laughs> or however old I was. Ah, uh, yes. I said wow, you know. <laughs> so you know, I was really pushing the limit there. Mm -hmm. but, uh, and nobody at my age was, you know, doing the acrobatics and you know, types of techniques. <laughs> uh, and one of the hardest things to overcome is the fear, too. You know, like when you're up in the air and you're upside down, <laughs> you know, how do you change or adjust your body to know that you're going to land in a half of a twist? Or how do you land on something that goes awry? You know, th those types of things. That's mm -hmm. scary. But you learn to overcome those in the, you know, first few years of gymnastics did you deal with injuries i did uh i probably tore my hamstring three times uh i injured my right knee i tore ligaments on the inside of my right knee a couple of times uh yeah it, it was tough it was tough so but after about 10 years, I think it was around 2009, 2010, is uh, when I stopped. I stopped uh, going to Wushu. Um, and I, I was introduced to where I am today uh, by a, a, a friend. Uh, from a, there were multiple people in the same family, so I'll just say the Pimentel family. 